for making clear sense. They are not really reporting, you know, what should be reported. So you see a lot of um, uh, peripheral work or work on the surface where when you should be dealing with something that addresses a particular situation that will lead to the development of a new knowledge, you see it not happening. You know, so there's this discontent uh, or dis disconnectivity amongst the artists where there is no sharing, which also goes back to the family where there is no sharing and there is no sharing both in the micro and the macro levels, you know, and it has affected um, uh, art production and uh, art practice within um, uh, our system. And what I'm trying to say is that everything is based on love you know as a christian you know in in, in my in the bible in, in, in first corinthians say if you have everything yeah in first corinthians 13 chapter 10 if you have everything you can have it without love you have nothing you know if you see um for example in a city like lagos and you have you think you have all the resources you think you have all uh the attributes of being a mega city if you don't have love and how that love connects it's between leadership and the people we all saw what happened during the answers you know and that color was red <laughs> in the other sense it was red and red red on the op opposite side of it so if you don't have that true love you cannot really engage with people so lagos needs that color red <laughs> not red in terms of um aggressing you know you know engaging aggression you know, counter current to, you know, um, uh, the, 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 that um, unity that exists amongst people, between leadership, amongst people, amongst individuals in the family, people in the society. So I think there should be love and that love comes right from the family and it should transcend into leadership where the leadership shows love. And if there is love, we will see it in our transportation system, we see it in our education system, we see it in the way we treat people, we see it in the way we even practice art, you know, we see it in the way we engage with uh, different levels of the society. Like you mentioned, Underbridge Life, you know, that work was done in, in I think, in, in 2008, yeah, and it basically interrogates um, um, accidental shelters. You know, and, and I'm glad that today Lagos is trying to address underbridge life because there, there's a policy now. There's a policy in Lagos that that, uh, uh, that kind of um, uh, habitation should discontinue. So you, you rarely see people doing business under the bridge or people living under the bridge. But that work is also um, like an interrogation, a questioning on how society should run. And that's what art does. Art is also hinged on love because it asks questions, it questions. If there's no love in art, you cannot question. You just do practice art for practice of art sake, aesthetics and all the other stuff. But when you look at it from the point of love, you see that you know, art is very essential. You know? And you know, it's essential, we say in art is essential because it's provocative. That provocation is just about questioning. And we, we need to continue to question that love. You know, I, I don't know if I'm sounding too metaphorical here, but yeah. that's how that's how Amarachi started, and that's what I saw in, in, her, in her work. And I'm trying to yeah. interpret what I saw in her work to the question you asked me. I think everything is in the love, and without it, we can we can't really go far. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's very profound. I think yeah, it leads me at, and uh, maybe to the work of um, Oyinda because maybe, um, and I would just want to hinder to continue on that note to ask her i mean how easy for people who live on the fringe you know to be able to express love you know in within the context of sort of um, uncertainties and maybe lack of shelter and desperation how easy would it be to sort of cultivate an, a call of love or an attitude you know of loving oneself and loving the society mm. um you know living on the fringe Hi. Um, I mean, I think that's an interesting question, and uh, I don't know if I necessarily have the answer to that, but I can say that one thing about before I moved to Nigeria, um, I'll never forget um, my dad, like, you know, I think I was in Nigeria on holiday and my dad would let me go out or hang out a bit later than when I was in England. 
And I asked him why he would do that. And he said to me, because in Nigeria, we just love, we love each other or something like that, something along those lines. He just felt like somebody would take care of me, you know, if I was hanging out a little bit later. And a few years later, a few years, maybe even a decade later, I found myself in a city in Africa where um, we were robbed. Um, and I'll never forget, I was like having this whole like panic attack. Like I was chasing after because it was like high speed, like full high speed chase um, to try and catch this car. And the person I was with was hanging out the car because they had tried to grab the laptop. And I was like, after, you know, after the whole scene went down, not one person came to help us. Not one person stopped. No one like came to see if we were okay. And I know that that's not the case in Nigeria. There's nothing could happen to one person in Nigeria that somebody else wouldn't get involved in, you know? So we actually do care. We, we care, we're very communal as a people. Um, and I mean, that's why we just say, we thank God that, you know, COVID hasn't been as bad as it was because even a, a two, from two week to one month lockdown was like hell for us because we are relational people. Now, in terms of being on the fringe, I think in general, being on the fringes does kind of put up barriers to anybody anywhere in the world. Once you're on the fringe, it does kind of cut you off or isolate you ever so slightly from um, feeling or being loved. Um, you know, society will let people fall through those cracks. I mean, that's, it, that's the way it go, goes in a country as well that has no real social structures that are built in to catch people so I think it's hard and I think it's a personal decision you have to make that have that conviction to be loving to show love I mean even to Nigeria like when people talk about Nigeria I that I, I know the people who will say they hate Nigeria or Nigeria has treated them badly or they don't like Lagos and then I know the people who are madly in love with this nation and madly in love with you know the city and I think it's a conviction. So it starts with you as a person, like where do you stand on, you know, on relating with people? And I think that's the first step. It's a, it's a conviction, it's personal. You love not to be loved necessarily and not to get. Yeah, that's um, really interesting. I'm actually, I don't know, Jera, would you like to comment on, on the third question about living on the fringe and, um, yeah, being able to give out the, the feel because I know it's um, part of the exhibition that we make the, the, the feeling, we create the feelings of the, the city and the spaces that we inhabit. So how, how, how difficult or how easy it is for people who are desperate or who are living on the fringe to, to give out, to put out good feelings or you know, live in a, in a humane or ecologically um, you know, um, you know, safe way for the for the environment. Gerald. Okay. Um. Yeah. This is what I'm talking about. The the love, I like how Uche has brought it in. And I think love is, is contagious. Like many other things are contagious. But if I always say, if you want to receive love, give love, you know, you first, you give it and then it comes back to you. It, it can be really difficult to, I mean, it's possible, but I think it's difficult when you're smiling at somebody and showing love and they are not returning it. So that's what I'm saying. If we can love more as a people, the city is ours, the nation is ours. Even if, um, as we often say, government this and government that, if whoever the government is, if they are doing their own thing, we can make the city better for us, you know? And when we see, say people living on the fringes, it can be, relative i mean there are people there are all levels of class but the people that you you say are really on the fringe even if they are living under the bridge sometimes you find that there's also a lot of love in those kind of places 
They may be poor, they may be hungry, but they look out for one another. So if we can look, at, look out for one another at every level, there, right there is the color of the city. If, if you are in that small place and everybody who is there with you loves you, and if something is happening to you, people are asking after you, people are coming you know, to take care of you in whatever way that they can, that you would say, oh, the color, this place is, is good for me, even though you'll be looking for something more, you know, you'll, you'll be looking for a better placement. Well, yeah, love at every level. So whether you're on the fringe or more than the fringe, if there's anything yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. That's really, really interesting. And um, OK, just um, moving on. I think um, one thing also that I really find exciting about uh, the exhibition was, of course, one, the performativity of the door. It's, it's interactive in the sense that people you know, can move through the space, they can touch the pouches, they can, you know, write and, uh, you know, notes and put in the, in, the con in the box, in the containers and all of this. So I think for me, movement is really, is really a strong, um, has a strong resonance when I, when I think about the work. A movement of people through spaces, through streets, and um, of course, through cities. And what I would want to ask, I don't know if Gerald, I would maybe like Gerald to start on this one. Um, um, thinking about, you know, how movement help us create intimacy with our surroundings. Um, I think that um, motorized transport, I guess, say, has kind of, um, of course, introduced a variety of ways, maybe unnatural, maybe easier, but, you know, but quick ways that we move around our environment. And uh, I just want to ask, how does this um, sort of um, this um, new introduction, um, how do you say, how does this sort of um, rise of the use of vehicular movements through the city affect our sense of presence and intimacy with our surroundings? OK, great. Um, it's, it's fantastic to be on this panel. Um, I just, before I get into that, I just want to say something I, I um, noticed uh, when I, I, I uh, went to see Amarachi's work. Um, you know, it, it, it seemed like, which is a bit strange, you know, sometimes as artists we walk and um, we don't know what is guiding us. The containers that the box is standing beside the, the pouches and the pulses that were very colorful, they were monochromatic, you know, they were just one color. And guess what? They were huge. So they kind of overlook the works. That's what I was seeing. And it started to bring to my mind the things um, about like the Greek gods who will use, um, you know, who will, you know, be like plain human beings as pawns, you know, like a game of draft or chess. And for me, that, that sort of um, talks about the society we live in today. Um, the, the colors that we exhibit um, ha have to come from within, like Linda said, they have to come from within, even though there are massive, tall, robotic boxes trying to control what we do to their favor. Um, mm -hmm. That could be political, but that's what I saw. When I walked into that exhibition and I walked through, it, it was as if those boxes were, were making very loud but silent. Um, statements and how the colors emerged. But in spite of that, they also rolled out their colors, which was very beautiful. Um, the movement, coming to the movement, you know, the effects. I think, I think um, that movement is, is, it actually promotes love. I think it promotes love because you see, it, it's making it easier for, because the nature that our country, especially in Nigeria, and even around Africa, you know, people um, have diverse culture, even though we're in the same community, 
from a place to the other, you see people with different kind of cultures, which is very fantastic and, and helps creativity, creativity a lot. But because it is easy to move from one place to the other, we can cross culture and you know um, affect each other in positive ways. Another thing I want to talk about that makes love um, evident and um, you know promotes it is the fact that we seem to have um, uh, a common, in quote, a common foe. Everybody agrees to something that look like a marriage said there, there could be love under the bridge, and I completely agree with that. We all believe that some kind of people are against us as a whole and so want to grow love so that we can enjoy it. I think movement also helps that um, because you can easily move from one place to the other. And as you move in the same vehicle, for instance, you interact with each other. And when you enter that vehicle and move from one place to the other, you actually agree. It's a form of agreement because we want to get into this, uh, say, bus and we're going to a certain location. It's an agreement. When you have that kind of agreement, even though you don't speak a word, a certain energy arouses and then you begin to agree without even speaking a word so is it helpful yes i think it is helpful um to promote the love that we want to preach especially in this time that we find ourselves in that's what i think um you know movement like that can do for us even as creative people uh, that's fantastic thank you um anyone from the panel wants to just um touch on the subject of movement and um, intimacy and presence within cities? Um, so for me, uh, just thinking about um, the way I feel Lagos is set up in a way that... So there was a business that opened up near my house and it was annoying me. Like it was just such a, like, it was just a nuisance to the community. Should I say that? Uh, and I realized that a lot, there were other people that used to come into the area and go out. And because even though they were part of the community, but they were not part of the community enough to care that this um, business was like, being a bit of a pain. Um, so I just felt like it doesn't, it didn't feel real like they were a part of the community, even though they came in and they came out and everything. I just didn't feel the love, should I say? Um, and yeah, it really it stuck. It, it made an impression on me on what community really meant and how visiting and leaving a space, um, you know, the kind of relationships uh, that form based on community people, community environment. Um, and then like, just thinking about CCA, we are where we are because of the community. We are there because our first love is artists, our first love are, and, you know, not buyers, for instance, you know, that the, our community are artists. And so a lot of people um, or a lot of art galleries, for instance, have opened up in on the island because the island's where it's at um, in terms of maybe finance or in terms of maybe buyers. But if we wanted to, and this is what the founder had, you know, when she thought about the space, she wanted to be part of the university community and be close to, you know, Yaba Tech, Unilag, because her love was artists and art making. And so, you know, movement is, it, 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 has, it has its pros and its cons, because then you could think about it if, if we then moved from where we are now uh, and we weren't as easily accessible to our demographic, then movement can hinder. So there's lots of ways of looking at it. Yeah. Can I, I, can, I, mm -hmm. can I just make a few points there? Can I yeah. go ahead? Yeah, yeah. Um, talking about movement and in a city like Lagos, um, I don't think we've achieved that, um, uh, up, that up, will I say optimum movement that will 
grow the arts, you know, because when you look at, when you compare Lagos to big art cities like, um, for example, let me say Paris, um, uh, New York, these are, you know, we, we call them um, first world countries. Yeah, but I don't want to go that route, but I'm looking at it in terms of movement and how we can use it to our own advantage. If you look at Lagos, the way it's structured, we've not really had an impactful uh, movement that supports arts. That's why you see um, basically like Oyinda hinted, like location, for, uh, this is location and the island where it's, some, it, it's like a kind of bubble where, you know, when you mention an art event in, on the island, people get to go there. But when you mention, uh, when there's an event on the mainland, you, you, you have few people turning up. But that's a different case. What I'm trying to say is that the kind of um, structure for transportation, which enables movement in, in Lagos, because Lagos is a cultural hub, it's not, um, has not really helped. You can imagine if there's an exhibition maybe in CCA and there's no train stop in CCA and there's a traffic and or there's traffic <laughs> between Habak Makole and Motel Mohammed where you see very few um, people turning up or showing up for that event. And it's the same for every other part of Lagos where movement uh, of people uh, are hampered by the traffic situation. You know, if our people, yeah, I mean, people in leadership, people in government, the people that have the authority to make things work, can invest in this aspect. I had, I had a, lot, uh, a few years ago, I had this uh, colleague that came from the States and um, we were driving through Ikoroduru and there was this, this huge traffic. He said, Uche, now I know that Lagos, traffic in Lagos is legendary, you know? And she just said to me, but the solutions are very easy. I, I said, I know. You know, you can imagine I want to go to CCA. I'm coming from, for example, from Allen, or I want to go to, let me leave CCA. I want to go to um, maybe have, uh, go to Urbanikoro, and I, I have, to, I, I can't make an exit at Urbanikoro. I have to go to all the way to Jibo to make a U-turn to come to Urbanikoro. So it's crazy. So this also affects, if you, whether I agree or not, it affects art. It affects movement. So when you don't have urban, urban planners working together with artists, because I think they should do that with artists because artists help in regener regeneration of, of cities, development of cities in climes where things work very well. So if you get, if this group of people, people in government, people in, in authority leadership can work with artists to maybe focus on transportation, I think things will be a, a, very, uh, a, a bit more um, uh, accommodating, you know, where people, mass transportation, uh, you invest billions of dollars in mass transportation, in rail line, in trams, in canals, like Lagos can be structured like Amsterdam because you have natural canal roads behind Sheraton, everywhere you have canal roads, but they have all, they've all been built up. So how are you gonna build or construct canals in Lagos where this how this this these tracks or these pathways, water pathways have been built up. So when you develop an intramodal system of transportation where you have trams, you can have it, you can have tram running in between the road road all the way from Maryland to Yaba. It's easy. So that I have an event to attend, maybe in CCA, I jump into it. I don't need to bother driving down there. You know, so what I'm trying to say, the kind of structure, transportation structure that enables movement. In Lagos, for example, uh, it's different in Abuja. I don't know what's going on in Abuja now if that system is breaking down. But in Lagos, the whole, the entire transportation edifice is, is, is flawed and should be uh, kind of um, revisited so that it can be opened up. You know, change comes with a lot of pain. Yeah. If they have to de demolish other certain areas to create, to open up places, they should do that. But they have to consider the people first where you compensate, you engage in dialogue, you compensate people who will lose their properties, and then you open up. I think they are doing some kind of uh, uh, construction in Yaba as it now, especially around um, Motala Mohammed, where they're building an overpass. It's high time that we open up spaces, spaces of transportation that will 
allow free movement. If you don't, if you don't do that, this is 2021. Uh, we are in the 21st century. If you don't do that, we are going to choke. Look at the population. We are, we are going to choke up, and it will affect the arts. It will affect other 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 uh, 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 sectors of the economy. Art is part of that ecosystem, and we need people for art to grow. And if people don't come to see exhibitions, if people don't come to see uh, festivals or art uh, uh, events, how will art grow? How will people move? How will Artists visit, you know, how, how are we going to engage in studio visits? How are we going to develop the art sector if we don't, if we don't allow for free movement, if we don't create structures that allow for free movement? You know, I think it's, it's very important. And I like the fact that you asked that question because art is not just about, like I said earlier, that it's not just about creating. We question. If we continue to question the government about the transport system, because we do it through our work, like uh, Chukuma said in uh, uh, while he was analyzing Amarachi's work, the first day I saw that work, I saw a city. We, I, Oyinda was there, we were analyzing. It was, it's, well, I saw like the sea in Lagos, I saw the uh, Isaleko, I saw the colorful part, I saw the lake and everything. But if we don't connect these places through an effective, efficient intramodal transport system, we are not gonna develop art. So we'll just be entering everybody one way on third and we are going to VI to, to see maybe uh, Lagos Photo, Lagos Binia Art X. But what about other places? I think that somewhere opened up in Oshodi. If you say there's an art space or an art event in Oshodi, people start thinking, how am I gonna get to Oshodi? You know, how am I gonna like get Oshodi? Or uh, if there's somewhere in Agege, ah, Agege, how am I gonna go to Agege? Ah, in Keja, how am I going to get there? So everybody is thinking in one direction, VI. So we need to look at, we need to look at as artists, how through our work, we can speak to these guys in leadership to open up spaces. Transportation, it's, um, it's, um, uh, uh, it's a big business for people who are serious. The, the government will make money, private sector will make money, artists will make money because you're going to open up these spaces. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's um, to, yeah. yeah, that's um, fantastic. And maybe Gerald, I would maybe just like you also to comment a bit if you can, if you can. And just, um, I mean, how important do you think that an, if, of an effective um, transportation system is, you know, in helping us develop um, values that, um, that will help us flourish as communities and um, as individuals? Yeah, um, I think Uche is, I mean, is completely right. Yeah, I, I have, I, I used to have a studio in Yaba. And after the lockdown and the pandemic, I started, in fact, I wanted to move out of Lagos completely I had set up the space outside Lagos. I had finished everything. I was almost moving out of Lagos. I wanted to be in a quiet place and make my work and enjoy it. And I expect people to come and see also because it's supposed to be that. But after the pandemic and the lockdown, I mean, it's not over yet, but um, after the lockdown, I started to think differently. This space was set up, but let me, let me shock you. I moved my space from Yaba, instead of the place I set it up in, in the east, I moved it to Leke. So Uche is, so, so it, has, it has shifted my mind. Question I ask is, do we ride the sail or do we fight the sail? I love what is happening today because it's a form of digital transportation. We really need a lot of digital transportation because um, if you say that with think we are going to solve more activities, I have tried to look it through. I have had my face all around. The, the, the transmission issues will be solved, but it takes a lot of time. Meanwhile, when we're solving it, what do we do? Yes, um, when I was looking at Amarachi's works, I told her this well, prior to this conversation where you know, we're talking aside, and I said, I wish 
this work was existed. Where everybody can interact, okay. raise a to create um, a document out of this exhibition because a lot of people exchange ideas, especially the fact that someone has to put something in an envelope and I have to take it as I read it and I raise my mind and somebody raises his mind and we're interacting. It would have been fantastic. In fact, a document would have come out of this if the transportation system was perfect and people could come from everywhere to CCA. Now, question I always ask myself is should we ride the sail? or should we fight, I mean, the wind? Should we ride the wind or should we fight the wind? If, if we want effectiveness, then sincerely what you're doing is perfect because this is transportation beyond shores, but I think we should have more of it. You know, get more people involved. Do a Zoom meeting that can take an entire department of art, maybe the entire department. And so we keep talking about this. And um, because true, the transportation system in Lagos is almost, chaotic every day, every day, even on Sundays. So you can come from Ikorodu, for instance, and go straight to um, Yaba to view a show and, and you're not sure something will happen along the way. So um, we need to work on it, I agree, but we need to do a bit more. For instance, I, I tell you, we can collaborate. That's where collaboration comes. So and we can take some of it to the streets of Freedom Park. Why not? So we interact. I mean, I'm saying we should ride the wind. We need to make our statement because the problems are there, but we aren't going to shut up. Like Uche said, this is who we are. We ask questions. This is why we are here. Artists have to you know, talk about issues. And if no one is seeing it, then have we passed the message? So yeah, it is a problem, but we need to find creative ways. Because we are creatives. Which one of is what you're doing? Very important. Create more avenues to talk and talk and talk and use videos and all that. Thank God for the digital times. And then, you know, because this is transformation too, but it's now in the cloud. So yeah. fantastic. I mean, I'm happy with this. So I think that that's how we can begin to, why we continue to push the people involved and say, get us roads, get us um, boats and, you know, and fly over us too. Yeah. Well, wow. Amarachi, I think Amarachi has something to, to add to this conversation. Hi, I, 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 I just had questions going on in my head. Um, Gerald has sort of uh, touched on some of them. But what I'm, I'm thinking, I mean, my, my work, my, how things rise in my mind, you know, in terms of uh, relational public art. I mean, I'm passionate about people and uh, audiences. Yes, art is the first thing, but the people, the human beings, humanity, society, who, are, who I am talking about, you know, I'm very concerned. And this is all about having conversations. I call it relational, you know, a thing, conversation. So I am thinking now, how can we make all these things we're saying happen? There seems to be a disconnect between the policymakers and us. So how can we make, you know, all the things that need to be put in place, the transportation system? There are, it's not just transportation in Lagos. Lagos is, is I mean, for me, when I come from outside and so we see it, it's kind of small. Apart from Lekki and the new areas, it's small. It's sort of, there's rubbish <laughs> in places that shouldn't be. So who, who is looking after us? We talked about people in fringes and I said, yes, there's still love there, but there should be, who is looking after us? Is it us looking after ourselves or the system, a higher system that should, look after us how can we make things come in place that should be is it to continue talking which is what i'm uh, what i'm also advocating but maybe there should be more i don't have the answers i'm just bringing it out there like what can we what can we do who cares for the people the people of lagos color of our hearts the color of the city who is interested that has the the, the power 
to do things that will change this color of the city for us? Is that is that a, a, a question that I shouldn't ask, but is in my head? <laughs> and I think Oyinda wants to say something to that. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, I think it's a good provocation. Um, I think what we need to realize is that it's one thing for us to talk amongst ourselves. It's another thing for us to collaborate. Um, I love the idea of, um, you know, artists working with urban planners. Um, a lot of the work I do in the healthcare space, we did that um, before um, we connected with the current Minister of Health. And I have to say, he's been amazing with us. Like, uh, he has, he loves the arts. So he's been able to see how art and health can come together and create pathways for um, interaction in health and healing spaces that maybe someone who is more traditional would not have. Um, and I think it's about finding um, people who operate in the spaces we want to make change happen, who understand our way of working and who was able to distill the thinking that we have into their practice. Because at the end of the day, as artists, I'm not an artist, but as an artist, I would assume that an artist would take the theme of, of transport issue and they'll, and they'll share it the way they know how to. They'll paint a picture or they'll sing a song or whatever that really um, drives home, you know, what the issues are. But a policymaker makes policies or implements policies. They're not going to come and sing a song, you know, in, in I don't know, the, uh, you know, wherever they operate from. <laughs> They're going to have to distill it and change, you know, um, present it in the manner that the people that they talk to and who <laughs> make laws or who implement laws are able to run with. And I think... It, it, you know, it's about being able to communicate and it's about, you know, ho having a holistic space of operation. And yeah, I mean, uh, how many roundtables or how many, you know, policy dialogues are artists participating in um, with real key decision makers? Um, for me, I, I think very, a couple of years back, I, I think it was a UK, she was from the UK parliament. And she said, you know, I started my career as an artist and then I moved into politics. And I thought that was really interesting because here she was coming to actually speak to women in arts again. So she basically knew where she came from and she knew where she wanted to make an impact, but she wasn't doing it in turn. She wasn't turning her back on where she came from. Instead, she was carrying on the conversation, but from a new space and a new sphere of influence. And I think it is about spheres of influence. If you're talking amongst yourself, you know, nothing's really gonna happen, but if you're able to influence the influencers or influence the key decision makers, then I think the changes that we want to happen or take place will happen because, I mean, I don't want to speak negative about like our leaders or anything, but if somebody is a lead that has gone into leadership because they, I don't know, want to commit crimes and they want to be, have the power to commit crimes and not be able to, to be above the law, then if we want to make difference, we need to be in, in a space where we can make the difference. And it won't happen unless we engage with this top level or top sphere of um, decision, key decision makers and impact makers, I think. That's, that's my own understanding. But then that's to say that this is a multi-layered um, and multi-headed hydrant that you know, we are facing because there's not one right or wrong decision and there's not one action that will be enough to bring change that we're looking for. Um, anyone wants to, to comment on that? Because I mean, as supposed to, I mean, of course we, I think we have, uh, it's fair to say that, uh, our leaders have established uh, uh, a trajectory of not um, paying attention of the, you know, to dialogue or to or giving listening ears to 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 artists or to what um, you know the ordinary people the cries of the ordinary people and maybe we can start with Uche here I don't know I mean 
I mean, how important is it is it to to establish Lagos as a, as an activist city? I mean, how important is activism? Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of changing the color of cities. I mean, is everything just based on kind of a, um, moral and mental sort of um, reorientation? Or is it important? I mean, how important is, is activism um, to changing the colors of, of our cities? Um, thank you. And that's um, a bit um, deep and broad. And um, um, I'm thinking like, because of what you've just said, activism, I'm thinking of how to uh, direct my answer, you know, because there are so many things, just like Koyinda said, you know, that, there are so many things we can do through collaboration between the artists and also um, people in government or people in leadership on how we can regenerate this city. You know, it's not just Lagos, other cities, because Lagos can't just be the only viable city in Nigeria. It should spread across board. You know, it should, we have 36 states in the country, and I think that each city should be as viable as Lagos. And I think that the honors here is not just only on government. The honors is also on us, the citizens, and also particularly us, the artists. You know, it, making cities viable, it's, um, it's very holistic. You need a holistic plan. You need, um, you need um, commitment. You need uh, structure. You need passion, you know, because if you have, even if you have all the resources, you know, whether you are in government, like you see, they are throwing billions left, right, and center. If you have, can have all the money, you know, monies, but if you don't have that passion, that political, I, I might, let me refer to that passion as both the political will and the passion, political will on people, uh, uh, with people in government and passion for us who are the artists. For example, if you are an artist and you don't have the passion, to do what you're doing, you, you stagnate and you become redundant. So we need some kind of, um, of a plan, you know, a plan. Let me, let me come down to the arts. We need, for us artists, we need a plan. You know, we need, uh, let me borrow Yinda's word, collaboration is very key. You know, this is the 21st century and this is the era of um, where people do things together. and. That's why, uh, let me say, people in the West, in, maybe in the North, that's the, um, the Occident, have really gone ahead of us. Like when you talk about, uh, when you refer to um, people in terms of regions, I'm not talking about Northern Nigeria or Southern Nigeria, I'm talking about globally. You know, when you look at the North as in a global space and the South as in uh, uh, down here at Southern Hemisphere, you see that, you know, people do businesses as, uh, 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 as, as collectives. People engage government as collective, collectives and government do stuff not on their own. Like, because we've been talking about transportation here. Government cannot run transportation. You build the rolling blocks, like do the tracks and open it up to the, uh, the private sector, you know, to run. Like in England, you have Virgin has, uh, they have, you have Virgin trains but the government build the tracks. It's the same thing, policy making. Government make the policies and people and regulate and then the private sector now begin to introduce uh, different ideas and to innovate these ideas for the benefits of people within a particular city. Let me say, for example, Lagos. We don't even have an art policy for governing Nigeria. If there is one, please, Amachi, tell me. You need to tell me. Is there... No, no, there is no art policy. And that's why you see artists have not really potentiated their, their God-given talent for you know, our cities or for the city to develop. Lagos was, um, I think in this book, uh, 12 Cities of, um, uh, what's the name of that book that was predicted to be one of the major art cities in the 21st century. And you know, a lot was written about Lagos and what events, the art festivals, the Binyals, that energy, but you see that that energy seems as if it has been containerized in inactivity. You know, nothing is happening. You know, no support. You know, not that we depend on government. Basically, everything that we have, we have 
as artists or artistic pl platforms have achieved in Lagos is artist dependent, artist based, artist led. No support, no support. I can give example with my own platform, the Lele Institute. All that we've done, I've achieved. I'm not that I'm begging the government. What we are to give me anything. All that we are looking for is is there a policy that will guide the arts, art production, that will also help in the development of the city. For example, like cities in, like in, in, in London, and I remember when the, I think the current uh, mayor came, uh, I think he's of Indian descent. The first meeting he had was with the art community. And he, because he under, understood that importance, that the art is vital for the development of the city. Look at what is going on in, in London. I don't even want to generalize it as the UK. In London alone, look at the art, you know, the manifestations, the galleries, the events, the residences, everything going on there because there's a policy. Because they know that if you open up the arts, people will come in. It's, it's linked to uh, uh, tourism. People will come in. People will stay in England. I have um, uh, a colleague, a mentee, who's uh, at the Gasworks at the moment. I think she just finished. She's been there for three months. And you know what that means? It also impacts the artist and also the city and also the platform. So if you don't have an environment that is supported by friendly policies, you can't have, you can't have development. In the 70s, when um, New York was going through hardship, you know, it was going through hardship, New York was going through hardship, companies, factories were shutting down, the artists moved in. They took, in the, they took, they took up these spaces, you know, used the spaces, the factories and regenerated, uh, uh, transformed the economy. And the economy bloomed, blossomed within that period. You know, you can't say that for Nigeria. Sorry, I'm a Christian, but we are too immersed in, in religion and tribalism. We are, you know, the, the factories are shutting down and churches are taking over. They are not producing anything, you know. Most of these places should go to artists who can, like when you go to the island or, or uh, Lagos Island, you see a lot of empty spaces, empty spaces for 20 years, 25 years, empty. Nobody's using them. You know, these spaces could, uh, could as well go to the arts to artists who can use these spaces, you know, when they open up these spaces, we create them, we generate them, you see employment comes, people will visit, people, even people from, you know, other parts of the world will come because there will be this cross-border, cross-border cross, cross border collaborations, you know, cross-border collaboration, that's how art circulates. You know, art does not circulate on its own and a city that does not support art, a country that does not support art is as good as dead. I'm telling the truth. Art is very important. It's like food you eat. It's like water you drink. Let me stay without water now for the whole day. Now let me see how you feel. Yeah, that's how, stay without food for a whole day. Let me see how it's. That's how art is. Art is like a. It's, it's like a, a. It's like blood that flows in the veins. You know, the veins of the of, of a country of a nation. I don't even want to say country because country is just when you when when you look at what is on the ground, the resources the minerals and everything. But a nation is when there's, a, there's leadership, one person leading. And when you look at that leader, you see the mass following him from the rear and they are moving in one direction. We are basically direct, directionless because there is policy somersault. We make a policy today, not even in the arts. You make a policy today in maybe in, in, in importation. The next day, they turn it around. So how do you, how do you attract um, FDIs? You know, how do you attract foreigners or foreign investment? When you make a policy today, tomorrow that policy is, 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 is removed. We go into other sectors in, in, in manufacturing. You bring in a policy today, today tomorrow it's, it's, uh, it's removed. So there's so much instability in the polity. You know, if we can get our arts right, you know, I, I don't know how it's unfortunate that this, this meeting is just limited, you know, here within this space. And we can't really get this message out. If people, if there's a way we can, through collaboration, like Oyunda said, collaboration is key because when people work together, they're able to, you know, you know, highlight their voices, you know, so that, you know, you know, raise it up so that people can hear them and begin to make, you know, statement, statements that can touch, you know, those guys out there that push pen and paper every day, the, the bureaucratic people, you know, and, you know, so that they can have everything. 
you know, have everything and think about the arts. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm particular about art because I've been an artist since uh, 2016. My, my background is food engineering, but I picked up art, art in late 2005 and I've been in the arts. You know, I've been a mentor and I've become, I've been an art educator and an independent curator for almost 15 years, you know, so, and this is my life and I, I want to engage in it and I want to make, you know, I want to use this, the platform that I have as, uh, as a mediator, whatever you call it, to build the next generation. We need to find ways to build people. What we, we are in the business of building people. It is only when we build people that we build our cities. It is only when we build our cities that we build a nation. We are still a country. We are, we are still talking about oil. Oil will finish one day. It will finish. We are in a digital, we live in a post-document generation. Like for today, when you go to the bank, they are not only looking at your passport. You know, you need to put in your PIN number for you to assess something. They don't know, even if you show your passport or your ID card, you still need to put, put a PIN. So, you know, even in, for us that are involved in, in visual literacy, we still need to do more awareness campaign per se to educate our people about, you know, images, photography and art and everything. And I, I, I'm very glad that, you know, on the day of the opening, I was there to see Amarachi's opening and I really understood what she was doing because she created so many windows for us to understand her work. I saw her work as a city, a city that needs to be built. You know, there were so many people that they, they were analyzing, you know, the different districts in Lagos through her work. Maybe she didn't even see it, but I saw it. You know, the Makoko, the Leki, the CBD, everything was contained. And you look at how the cityscape is structured. You know, it's people that build a city. People build cities, people build nations. You know, without people, I saw a video the other day, the Chinese uh, uh, district that was built up for a long time. Nobody occupied it. It was empty and they had to demolish it. You know, had to demolish it. There's a natural propensity that when you don't occupy a space, it degenerates. And when people don't occupy their cities in terms of uh, art practice, it will degenerate, it's happening. So we need to find a way to find solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Uchi, do you want to, um, sorry, Gerald, I don't know if you want to comment on that, but uh, yeah, I wanted to just jump on, on what Uchi is saying. And um, there's this familiar saying that if you don't know who you are, then um, you don't know, I mean, if you don't know where you're coming from, you don't know you the, the, the chances that you're going to know where you're going to is um is very slim so and um i know that your work deals a lot with cultural representation and you know discovering of, of, of our lost history and um i wanted to ask how important is you know knowledge of of one of history and, and of culture um to the to the um reorganization of societies or reorganization of cities you know do you do you feel like history and, and the knowledge of history has a role to play in this or should we um, um just be thinking futuristically in this sense you're on me Um, I think we lost Gerald. Can you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you. I said a people without a history will disappear. Let me tell you the technique, the, the in quotes the white man used. What did they want to do? They took away your name, took away your identity, took away your location. They, what is the plan to take away your history? Once your history disappears, you forget who you are, you will feel it. Once you fizzle away, you, you, you don't have a future. So future is built on history. I love what Richard said, accidental shelters. Are they accidental? That's the question. No, they are not. Nothing is accidental. Everything is energy. Something, go there. Something pushes you to that. So he, my work's a lot on, of course, history, culture. Why? Why do I do that? Well, you know, I, I I went to Soka and I started to pick up the Uli and I started and asked myself, this Uli, didn't we even communicate with this thing? What happened to it? Who stole it away? 
because we become the English we speak today, but we refuse to accept that. So I said, you know what? I'm going to make works that will continue to represent this thing until kingdom come because um, somehow somebody's going to say, oh, what is this? And guess what? Well, language is evolved. That's why, the, you know, lingua franca is English so that you take away your, your language so that you will disappear. So yes, we need culture. Now they can be adaptive. Culture is, is, is organic. You pick up other things and grow, but the foundation cannot disappear. But you can add and subtract, but the, who you are cannot disappear. So I don't want to go too much into it because we have, um, I know time is of essence, but I'm saying that without your culture, tradition, language, you will disappear. You see, Chinese people, they are very intelligent. They refuse to allow their culture to disappear. And yet, nobody's as technological as those guys. This, this, is, this is a fact. You can't, be, you can't let technology take away your personality, but you can be uh, technologically cultural. That's beautiful. So that's why I refuse to leave you know, the, the, the identity and continue to work on it. But my techniques have changed. Um, the way I even exhibit things change, but I will not leave the, the foundation because that's, who, that's what makes you who you are. Once anyone is able to take away identity, you have been saved. That's, I think I'll, I'll stop there. Wow, thank you very much. Um, um, yeah, I think I've been getting signals. Um, it's time to open up the, the conversation to include the audience. Some of them have been raising up their hands and uh, I think maybe now could be a good time to sort of um, throw in your questions if you have uh, um, anything to add or to ask um, either of the panelists. So um, maybe while we're waiting, I mean, or in there's some, I mean, a, a question that I wanted to ask you. Uh, I, I think this is also in your kind of um, area of expertise. Um, I mean, I think one thing that Lagos is well known for, like we've discussed, anyways, is 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 the traffic and the congestion. And even though, um, I mean, uh, most um, surveys are. Uh, you know, on Lagos, I uh, kind of agree that although millions of people in Lagos don't have access to you know, basic transportation, yes, the, the level of traffic congestion is, is, is increasing. Um, I mean, from a kind of mental health perspective, can you maybe tell us what the, the mental health impact of, of traffic jams on Lagosians could be, or just maybe just touch on it? From, from that point. Uh, yeah, I mean, I could use myself as an example. When I used to, um, I used to live in Awuyaya and drive all the way to Yaba every day. And I used to have a mantra, I will not die in traffic. I will not die in traffic. I will not die in traffic. I literally used to just say it to myself because it was just in... It was insane. It was intense. And this was before, this was before Lecky, um, what's it called? The Lecky Ekbe Road was fixed. This was when, you know, even when that road was still stand, even, you know, before the toll gate, all of that. So it was just intense. And I remember someone saying to me, oh, um, what did our governor do? What did he really do? He only built Lekki uh, Expressway. And I was thinking, if that was all he did, that was <laughs> in, kind of enough because it, you know, I hadn't really thought about how much being on the road and being stuck in traffic had, you know, how much of an impact it had because I'd come from a place where one, I wasn't driving, uh, I didn't, I, you know, there was public transport system that I could utilize. So, you know, just thinking about people waking up in the middle of the night to go to work, 
getting home in the middle of the night because they've been in traffic, having, you know, minimal amounts of time with their families um, because they're, you know, they're stuck on the road and just thinking about the aggression because look, you're in traffic, you're irritated. There's aggression, there's anger, there's frustration that comes up on the road. Um, you know, you hear about people just, you know, slumping on the on 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 you know on the wheel because really it 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 does have a lot of mental health and physical health issues you know associated with it um and i think it is important uh, for us to not just see that health takes place in um healthcare settings health takes place in the places people occupy you know and the roads are just one such place um yeah, and, and you know, so for me, it's about decongesting our roads, giving people, um, you know, shorter commutes. Um, and I, you know, last year, of course, the you know, twenty twenty had its 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 difficulties, but I do think that there many many businesses saw that their employees were committed and could work from home. You know, and I think that that actually opened up um, so much time for people. Um, and people didn't have to wake up, you know, in five minutes after going to bed, you know, to make sure that they'd be at work early. Um, they were able to work from home. And I think shaving off two, four hours um, of commute every morning and every evening has the like has such an impact on the way you feel um, mentally, emotionally, physically. Um, and so I actually really did welcome the fact that more and more people were given that opportunity to not have to be on the road um so yeah i do i think it's a it's, it's primarily one of the biggest mental health challenges um for us in lagos anyways um and i would love to i'd love for that conversation to take place amongst um urban planners and and mental health specialists yeah um anyone else wants to uh, maybe just chip in on that while uh, i think someone says uh, the Okay, I think I'll just um, read some comments from the chat. I think we have Ibukun, who said, uh, who said, in order for Lagos to work better, each must prepare to perform the leadership role by choice as a parent, teacher, preacher, civil servant, engineer, artist, etc., to get the job done. Um, okay, I think we have a question from, Oiza, um, can you go ahead and ask your question? Yes, hello. It's good to see everyone. And um, it's even better that we're all having this conversation. I'm Oiza Daba, I'm a journalist with um, Africa Related, and I cover a lot of um, works within the arts. I work with a lot of um, artists. Uh, I'm here on Amarachi Okafor's invitation, so thank you very much, and it's uh, great to see this um, uh, sort of amazing, um, these, these works as displayed by this artist. I've had the opportunity to talk with a lot of artists, like I said, and in this discussion, really, um, one, I'll give you an example, two examples. Um, one was um, when I traveled with uh, Professor Elena Tsui to Qatar, they had given, extended an invitation to him to uh, be part of a group of artists uh, for the public arts uh, for the Qatar airport. It wasn't built then. This was like two, three years ahead of it being built. They had extended invitations to artists to uh, 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 conceptualize so that um, they can have their commissioned works there. And um, 
it's, it's I, I cite that example to give the foresight, you know, uh, of, of governments, of policymakers, of people that um, take these decisions on, on, on our behalf as a people. And um, the second example i would give is um, speaking, you know, very recently with an uh, emeritus professor again, uh, Professor John Pixon, who's written so much and extensively on Nigeria. He's 83 years old now, and um, but you know, just tapping into his memory and one of the stories that he holds so vividly is um, the Lagos uh, Cathedral. Uh, when it was being built, and then Father Carroll, back in the day, I think it was in the 60s or 70s, had commissioned uh, Bruce and Overpair to um, do the Stations of the Cross. And so uh, what Professor um, uh, Bruce and Overpair did was to integrate the whole artistic um, uh, views, as he saw from an African perspective, you know, brought it into the faith. And, you know, those uh, structures of um, fixtures have been at that cathedral for um, decades until it was removed. And why was it removed? Um, the current parish uh, uh, people said it had fetish, you know, um, it was fetish, it had fetish uh, means or, you know, intonations or meanings, or, you know, so it's it's really just trying to, you know, really rationalize and for us um, to know that we have an original script in our hands. We have uh, original material in our hands as Africans. And, and this conversation moving from here really shouldn't be, um, if we can talk to these policymakers, is how, how can we galvanize? How can we come together as one voice and say, you, 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 for you to plan a city and not include artists is a no-no. You know, it's, 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 it's unheard of. And I really want to commend this conversation, commend, you know, the artists, you know, um, that showcase their works. And the thought process, you know, the, it's, it's a lot of work. I have a lot of respect for artists. And my direct question to you, Amarachi, is it's, it's great that you're able to put these um, envelopes and, you know, fuse these, this, this concept. And people are able to participate in it physically. Do you have any plan for this conversation virtually? Because a lot of people, I, I, I see the impact that, you know, this self-thinking or self-processing, you know, where we are the judges of our own selves, um, how these conversations proceed. So it's, it's good that it's taking that format, but short of people being at your exhibition, how else can you get that, that conversation going, you know, especially today? So thanks everyone. Sorry I talked too much. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think the question was directed to Amarachi. Okay, hi. Um, yeah, Oyiza, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Um, the only way that I know to even bring my thoughts to the limelight is the art that I'm making. I have no other plan <laughs> to continue, you know, the conversation. This is only one conversation. I mean, this is only one word. There are many other topics and many other things that I'm talking about. And I am hoping that all the people that are here will, you know, push the discussion. That's really why it's important to me to involve other people in these conversations. Like I call it relational, you know, conversations, because the the ideas are, are too much for me, really. <laughs> I remember a few years ago that I told somebody who is a, 
a senior colleague, he's late now. I said, the things that I'm thinking in my head, I feel like they are beyond me. Like I wouldn't be able to push them through. So what do I mean by that? Like it's a lot of, it's a lot of stuff, a lot of, you know, problems. I feel these things emotionally. It's not just, um, I think you and I have discussed this or used that before. It's not just that I make the art. I go through a, a lot of process. If you see my works take a long time to, to, to be birthed. All those times, like this one, four years, all the four years I'm processing these thoughts. So it's not enough for me. Otherwise I will continue on this for a lifetime. But I've devised this way of bringing people in. Like in this one work, you can imagine how many people, you know, bring their thoughts and bring their, their words into the work. There are 2019 pouches in that one piece. So my own voice and 2019 other voices. And I often say when I make these uh, kind of public ads, people come, they hear, they discuss, then they disperse. So for me, it's like multiplying, you know, the conversation. So that's the one way that I know. I don't have another way of finishing this and then going on to talk about uh, transportation or policy. I mean, I've said it now and um, thankfully and hopefully all the other people, everybody that hears about this will have something to say. Or even if it's just in their head, there's got to be an impact. I pray, I hope there is an impact. That's what I can hope for. I hope that answers. <laughs> that does. Thank you. It's just extending, extending it perch in this digital world that we're in now, um, especially to the diaspora, because okay. um, there, a lot of people have, we, we want to have say in our governments. You know, we want to be able to bring our governments in our various countries to, to go. We, we, want, we want to um, be a part of, you know, those voices that, you know, you talk to on the streets, you talk to. So that was what I meant, you know, in terms of extending the conversation to, um, you know, just beyond the people within your immediate um, environment. Uh, maybe you can, maybe you can advise, you know, there are many things we don't know. So perhaps, I mean, I'm not putting it to you to advise because you asked that question. I mean, you can talk to me later or any other person, you know, that has anything to advise. They are, they are, maybe this is a new thing, you know, that I have to do that would be useful again. So right now I don't have um, any other way that I can continue to push this, but I'm open to, to suggestions and thoughts. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think um, Uno, Uno Omar wants to make a comment, but uh, before before then, let me just read this to uh, to the panelists. Um, the comments from Lucy it said, "Mili Sinisi Balwa, the river has been polluted from the source. It is an infested city already. Prevention, it is said, is better than cure." And at this point, it will take a while to repaint the city to the color it needs to be. I'm actually, are we being too optimistic in terms of thinking that uh, maybe this, uh, I mean, in terms of thinking that the arts, you know, can change, can change things within a short while? Um, I mean, yeah. yeah, I actually will put this back to Lucy. Lucy, I hope you can hear Lucy Azubike. I remember um, complaining. Lucy is a very close friend of mine. We, we used to share a flat at some point. And I used to complain, this was when I worked in the government, that many things are wrong and that going there and trying to make a change was just a waste of my time. And Lucy said to me, no continue, continue in what you're doing. You do not know who will come and see it one day. Maybe all the things you're saying and writing will be put in a file and someday somebody will come and open that file and maybe tell make a change. Outside, okay? Tell us your idea. 
Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, she said to me, maybe one day, basically continue on what you're doing, continue on the right path. One day, something good might come out of it. And this is also what I'm saying. Um, if Milisin Isibalula's is river has been polluted from the source, but we can't just keep quiet and sit there. You know, we need to, we need to try and clean. We need to continue, you know, um, agitating, so to speak. If something is wrong and you sit idly in comfort, you know, it means you're saying it's okay. But if we are agitating, even if by our conversations and collaborations, and like Oyinda said, find a way to, to speak with the influencers or relate with them, one day something, something will change. It will change. It should change. So okay. I shouldn't lose hope. Yeah. Um, Unoma wants to say something and then E.K. and, and then Gerald. But Unoma, if you, you can <coughs> hear me, you, you can ask your question. I can indeed. I, I greet all my people. I have worked with about six people in this group. Uche, greetings. Lucy, Amarachi, Kemi, I think she's left. Oiza. And of course, Deborah Terrell. Deborah Terrell is the, um, the proprietor of the Charlestown Gallery here in Nevis, in the tiny, on the tiny island of Nevis. And she's, she actually has some of my work stuff at the moment because we, we did a makeshift thing in the middle of COVID when we weren't allowed to have uh, um, people come in or to, just to mark Africa Day in May. Anyway, um, yes, I agree with you. Lucy, I agree with you. It's polluted. When I moved to Germany after university in Ife, I couldn't speak any German, but that doesn't matter. There was a new party coming up, the Green Party, and everybody used to talk about them and say, oh, these guys need a, 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 a shower and a shave and stuff like that. And they began to garner more and more numbers and, and more and more ears listening to their voices. And what they showed people was that the ecosystems in their rivers were dead, and if not already dead, dying. Now, 30 something years later, those very same rivers are alive again because of policies that were implemented. But policy is useless if we cannot be honest with ourselves. We are not honest in Nigeria. We keep making all these noises. We, we make all the right noises. We say things that if we really check ourselves individually, we're not living by. It's all just nice noises. So until we can actually take a long, hard look in the mirror, and say, as they say in these funny groups, um, my name is Unoma and I'm an alcoholic or I'm a crack addict or whatever it is that we are. Until you admit what your problem is to yourself and honestly in public as well, you will not start to clean that prob problem up. And so I, I keep on coming back to our art spaces. I'll be back again in November. Uche, I'm coming to see you. Um, I keep on coming and you hear the same thing over and over. We're still saying the same thing. We're still saying the same thing. We're not actually doing anything because if anybody comes and makes the kind of noises that we say we should be making, they are shut down or people, people get very quiet and we move away from them quickly because I don't know why we want to keep being diplomatic with each other. Why can't we just call a spade a spade and not a shovel? And sometimes use swear words just to show how passionate we are. All this activism thing, activism means some form of shedding blood. It doesn't have to be real blood, but we, we need some metaphorical bloodshed, some sacrifices. And our cultures speak to and understand sacrifice. So why don't we start looking at how we can make sacrifices on the shrine and the altar so that we can clean this up. But this river that we're talking about, honestly, the river is there. They keep talking about it everywhere. 70% of our population is, population is under what age? I don't know the, the current age. Does anybody know? Whatever that age is, it's very Under young. 30. That's the river. But that river is, flows forth from our loins and our hearts and our heads and our spirits. And if we're not clean, they won't be either. That's all I have to say. Stay in touch, my friends. And please, I would like to, um, I would like to just say to Deborah, um, happy independence. Nevis had, I think it's in Nevis, had the 38th independence anniversary from Great Britain on Sunday the 19th, which was also the fifth anniversary of my grandson. Congratulations, Deborah. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, it's, uh, 
anyone wants to respond to that before you know EK Chimezie just asks his questions. Yes, I, I would really love to respond to that. Thank you, Unama. Jeez. <laughs> it's been a long time. Jeez. Uh, Jeez. Jeez. Yeah. Good to Jeez. hear from you. Yeah, Jeez. Good to hear from you. It's been a long time. And uh, you made the point. Yeah, we need to really make the sacrifices, you know, like as in spill blood. You know, if we don't do that, you know, we can't get anywhere. Because when you look back in history, countries or nations, countries that became nations spilled blood, you know, one way or the other for them to move forward. I think we really need to do that because we can't just be going round around circles and with all the talents, look at our, our, our youth, youthful population on that, on that therapy. And they, they are massive, you know, and they're a huge voice that we need now, you know, for whatever that will happen in this country. Like just briefly, like, uh, um, uh, um, Lucy said, you can't rebuild a city, but all you need is creativity. A city like Lagos can transform and you won't recognize it if you put that political will down and the passion and creativity. Yeah, Lagos grew organically, but you can still rebuild it. All it needs is that for people to sacrifice and that passion and the political will to rebuild it. It's possible. I don't think it's impossible. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Uche. Um, Ike, quickly just um, ask your question and then we'll just move on from there. Hello, uh, good evening, everybody. And uh, good evening, Amorachi. Good evening, everybody. I'm Ike Gerard. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not asking a question. I want to make a comment. I don't know if I'm allowed. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, my interest is uh, on the change, you know, I heard of change. I'm sorry I, I joined late, uh, but I'm interested in the change, the, the, the process of using art to change uh, the system or the situation. Uh, I would say that art is a very, very, <clears throat> excuse me, art is a very uh, strong tool a very strong medium for change. But the problem or the challenge is that most of us artists don't actually know how to use it. We know how to create art, how to produce art, but how to use art uh, can be a challenge. So if we can uh, get to learn how to use art, uh, it will be more effective you know, in the sense that when we talk about activism, for instance, uh, it's not enough to be an artist. Uh, it's, it, it will take us beyond just being an artist towards learning how to be activists before we can actually uh, use our art to effect change. We have to realize that it's not about selling the art. It's not about creating uh, very beautiful art and place it uh, in a roundabout or something. That's, uh, it, it, it doesn't have to end there. So we have to understand that in creating art, we don't only create the forms. We also have to go extra mile to evangelize the art or to evangelize whatever idea behind that very art. So it takes us beyond just creating the art and placing it in a gallery or in a museum and even go towards uh, getting to tell people about a particular idea that is uh, behind that very art. So in so doing, you start seeing that people can connect, even the lay people, uh, non -art, the non-art uh, population, uh, in the cities or in the countries, will start connecting to the relevance of art. And most times we, we also have to consider even delving into politics, probably part-time, maybe not full-time, but to have a say in the political uh, sector somehow, you know, maybe some, if we have such interest, so we, we take over that part and work. And 
platforms like this, like I, I the suggestion that this uh, discussion should continue. I think I buy into that idea, but the problem may be who is going to uh, probably fund it or who is going to really champion the cause. If discussions like this uh, would continue, it, it will make a lot of sense, uh, you know, whereby more people will come and probably pick one or two ideas uh, and we can enlighten each other or one another on the process of utilizing art or using art, you know. Uh, so uh, that's my take so far. I hope I've made uh, sense. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mickey. I think um, there's a lot to be said on, on, on all of them. Um, all the points you've made, and um, but yeah, we're currently running out of time. So, um, as a kind of um, wrapping up of the of the of this event, I'll just um, maybe like the the panelists to just yeah say a few maybe closing words, kind of trying to wrap up um, their ideas, and um, yeah, just tell us also where we can find them, maybe in person, online. And um, what you know, what exciting projects uh, they are working on, or we should be expecting to see from them. Um, just before the first person go, I think Sonte has written that in reference to Unoma's comment, having had the opportunity to closely observe and partake in Amara's process, I consider the color of our heart a sort of metaphorical spilling of blood. How else do we go about making sacrifices? Um, so anyone of the panelists who wants to start based on that uh, can, yeah, just maybe respond and then just give us their closing um, statement. I think that that's a really, oh, go Gerald, let me, let me let you go first, because I'm still processing that. But you're on mute. Hello? Can you see me now? Yeah, we can. Yeah. Just in closing, I'd like to ask you a question because of what um, she said. He, he talked about how do we become artists and then you know how to become activists too. I think that's a massive question because you see, you can know how to play football and not know what you're doing even when you're playing the game. You need a coach, you need a, 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 um, you know, an advisor, you need other people around you to bring out the best in you. And so I think we need that type. I wanted to ask Amaraji, being a curator, does it make, how does it make your work better? Because maybe that's going to make you a better activist or speak louder than you were supposed to speak. You know, so for me, that's um, what I want to end with, of course, I'm having um, a, a sh an exhibition in Ghana soon, but what is important is I'm doing a project titled Life After Death, and I was trying to see how we could make um, the symmetry, the community project, the symmetry, a better place. So it's called Life After Death. And then, so when you pass it, because we find that when we pass the symmetry, sometimes we always think about a fear, pain, death. So is it supposed to be so? Is there, is there something after that? I'm going to do an art around the community thing, and I'm sure I'll let the cat out of the bag when the time comes. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah, Matthew, can you maybe just um, follow up on um, Gerald's question and then also just um, give us a kind of closing statement? Um, hello. Yeah. Being a curator, how does it? affect my art i think he asked um prior to gaining more insights into curatorial practice i had less knowledge than i have now about how to that's how to manage the practice i said before that i see the art practice as this thing that is really like it's a life force. It's 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 not just something you do. It's it's, it's who you are. 
I don't know. <laughs> he's like a like a person. Like the way Catholics will say the Holy Spirit is a person, you know, he's moving. So art is 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 a force. It's not just it's not the drawing or the painting. So that force, the, the going to curatorial practice, like learning more helped me to just, you know, go to the back and see what's happening and learn how to manage. And it also brought um created this passion for audiences. That's where it all started. Initially, I would just make my art. Oh, I've made my work. But then who are you making it for? The people you're making it for, what are they thinking? What do they need? What do they want? You know, how, how can there not be disconnect between the work itself, the objects and the people? So that's, that's uh, what it's done for me. I don't know if that's related to activism, maybe being able to think more about the the audiences that are that are making the work for bring some set kind of a relationship i don't know i don't know if i've answered your question but there's nothing more apart from that it just it just helped me to be able to to get a grip you know on the whole thing and be able to to use it to make impact so I am like the maker and I am the like the, the translator, so to speak. So that's that's what is done for me. And I want to say thank you. Eh? Say again. To hit it on the head. Okay. <laughs> I hit the head. I hit the head on the nail. <laughs> thank you. So I want to say thank you to everybody that made our time to be here to talk about this with us. I'm really, really grateful from the bottom of my heart. I really, I, I'm really thankful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amarachi. Uche, do you want to jump in? Uh, well, yeah, uh, we've already said um, a lot. And um, like you said, I just want to wrap up uh, from my end and encourage people to participate in, in art. There's the CCA, they have an amazing library, um, lots of resources for both uh, artists and curators. I also want to encourage people to join our workshops at the Lele Institute that comes up um, every quarter at the MOCA. We use the MOCA space for now. So we have one starting on, um, on Monday. If you've not registered, um, you can go to the Lele Institute Instagram handle, look at um, at Ben Lele and get the information there. But I really want to say this has been uh, a very uh, insightful, you know, refreshing moment, you know, to discuss our art outside of the art, if you understand what I'm saying. So it, it hasn't really been this art and painting, and it's been what really affects us as, because we are human beings, individuals, and we live in spaces where most of the times we are, at times we are challenged, you know, like Yinda said, in, you know, living away and transporting to Lake. I've, I've actually seen one guy have a heart attack on traffic. Yeah, I've seen it, you know, on the traffic, the guy just like having a heart attack and thank God, uh, you know, I don't know what happened that day, it was just God that, you know, he was revived. We had to pour a lot of water, stabilize him. He was moved from his car, an ambulance came. It was. It was terrifying, you know, you know, seeing that, you know, you can imagine what the Lagos traffic does. So we need less of that, you know. In, for me, I stay on traffic at times, I get so tired. And in Lagos, you can't have three meetings. So you can't have three meetings in a day. Just plan for one, you know, plan for one meeting. <laughs> you can't have, I'm telling you the truth. You can't have three, four meetings. You just plan for one, if you're lucky, one and a half. You know, <laughs> just it's this is the city we live in, but we need to make it better, even as artists. But for me, what I think a lady, I think Oyiza said that you don't get artists involved in city plan. You do. You need artists to build the city. You know, you need you need artists to build a city, whether government wants it or not. You need artists to get involved in the regeneration of uh, the city or cities. Uh, I think it's key. It, it has happened in other places, in New York, in Amsterdam, in Brussels. I've I've seen it. So we need art to play a vital role in the recreation and regeneration and the rebuilding of, of Lagos. Thank you. Thank you very much, Uche. Linda, can you just, um, yeah, 
um, just say a word or two and tell us um, where to find you and um, the work that you're doing. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I want to say thank you to um, Amarachi for um, this wonderful exhibition and it's open right now. Um, it closes this weekend, so if you haven't seen it, um, do stop by CCA, which is at number nine, McEwen Street uh, in Yaba. Um, and then um, we have another exhibition opening the following week, The Paradox of Purpose. So, um, sorry, Table of Paradox. That's how you know I've got a lot of things on my mind. The Table of Paradox uh, opening on the 1st of October. Uh, so I uh, would love to invite you to that as well. Um, do follow all of our social media handles um, at CCA Lagos. Um, we do love to connect. Um, and a big thank you to um, Gerald and Uche who have joined me on the panel and Emmanuel who has come in as uh, one of our co-curators on the performance season. So you will find a lot of performance and live art from us at CCA over the next coming weeks um, and months. So I do hope to, that we get to engage with you again um, as we have done. And yes, just one more round of applause for Amarachi. <laughs> oh, and another round of applause for the audience. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, everyone. It's been an absolute pleasure to engage with you all. And this, uh, you know, however we're able to manage to connect now is quite important, even though digitally. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. Thank you, Marachi. Thank you, Uchi. Thank you, Gerald. And um, yeah, hopefully we'll be seeing much of you guys soon. And um, yeah, with this, we come to, it's seven o'clock already on the dot, so that's good. And um, if just nothing else to add, yeah, I think um, we've come to the close of this event and uh, thank you all very much. And yeah, I wish you all a good night. And um, I love you. It. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for the insightful section. Thank you.